and we are going to begin with that growing scrutiny of some of President-elect Donald Trump's cabinet picks. There are three names that we're specifically watching. First, former Congressman Matt Gaetz, the President-elect's pick for Attorney General. There are now bipartisan calls for the House Ethics Committee to release its report on Gates. Second, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the noted vaccine skeptic, was chosen to lead the Department of Health and Human Services. The reaction from lawmakers is, well, mixed. Committees that are going to be conducting hearings, there's going to be plenty of uh, scrutiny of these nominees' records when the time comes. There's a lot of things when I hear uh, him say that are like lifted from my speeches, uh, but there are other things he has said that give me great concern. And third, former Fox News host Pete Hegseth. He's president-elect's choice for defense secretary. The city of Monterey, California, releasing information from a police report showing Hegseth was investigated over an alleged sexual assault in 2017. He was not charged with a crime, and his lawyer tells NBC News it did not happen. The Trump transition team released a statement saying, in part, Mr. Hegseth has vigorously denied any and all accusations, and no charges were filed. NBC News health reporter Aria Bendix has a closer look at RFK Jr., but Let's start with NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Julie, the House Ethics Committee actually canceled a planned hearing to highly anticipated Gates report. So where do things stand right now and what are you hearing from lawmakers? Simply not only discussed that report, but a source told me that actually perhaps deciding and voting whether to release the Matt Gates report was on the agenda. And that is something that House Speaker Mike Johnson has put a full stop to this morning after he got back from his visit to Mar-a-Lago last night, where he did meet with the president-elect, although he did not specify what came up in their conversation. Take a listen to what he said earlier today. The of the House have always been that a former member is beyond the jurisdiction of the Ethics Committee. I'm going to uh, request, I'm going to strongly request the Ethics Committee not to issue the board. Transparency is always uh, the best course of action, particularly when it relates to high ranking government officials. Now, obviously, you see that juxtaposition from the top Republican in the House and the top Democrat. The thing is, though, the Ethics Committee has always been bipartisan. Uh, however, Republicans are in control of the House. So certainly, if Johnson messages that to the Republican chairman of the panel, he'll probably follow suit. Although he did say that this meeting this morning was not canceled indefinitely. It was just postponed, Sinclair. And Julie, as you showed us, we've heard from a few senators earlier about RFK Jr. How does his path to confirmation compare to, say, Matt Gates and some of those other cabinet picks. RFK is an interesting one because I think he's somebody who is drawing equal scrutiny perhaps on both sides of the aisle and could potentially see some crossover. Now, he is a noted conspiracy theorist. I'm sure um, your medical experts will go into all of that. But look, from the Senate and political perspective, you heard from people like Cory Booker who said, hey, I agree with him on some things, especially the food comments that he's made. Other things like the vaccine comments, misinformation, disinformation, or flat out lies are certainly going to be concerning for Democrats. However, you all also heard from some Republicans. I'm talking about Mike Pence, for example. He obviously doesn't have a big influence on Senate Republicans anymore, but he was in the Senate. He was a member of the House before he was the president of the Senate as the vice president in the administration. He had a lot of influence, and he doesn't want Republicans to support him because of his positions on abortion. So a lot to watch in this space. We know you'll be watching it. Julie Serkin from Washington, thanks so much. And speaking of RFK Jr., his nomination for HHS secretary will likely prove to be a showdown in a Senate. So here here to dig into it all, we've got NBC News Health reporter Aria Bendix. Aria, thanks so much for being here. Look, can you walk us through RFK Jr.'s record on health here? As we heard from Julie, some people are a fan of some of his stances, specifically around processed foods, but many are raising eyebrows when it comes to his vaccine conspiracies, his statements about fluoride and water. So what's the record? Yeah, so as you mentioned, some of his policies or agenda is uh, sort of based on a scientific origin. Other steeped in conspiracy. So let's take a look at really where he stands. Uh, obviously, the one that's most familiar to folks is the idea that vaccines cause autism. A patently false claim has been widely debunked by someone, and someone who lost his medical license was actually the originator of that theory. So um, we could toss that one out. Uh, he's also promoted COVID conspiracy theories, saying that the virus ethnically targeted certain groups, white and black folks, over Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese people. Some really scary claims there. Uh, suggested that cell phones and Wi-Fi cause cancer, that fluoride in the water is linked to IQ loss, 
or various diseases, dubious claims there. Uh, the one glimmer of hope here is that he has said that he doesn't like processed foods or synthetic diets in school lunches. And we know obviously those aren't great for kids, so at least there's that. And, you know, as these sort of cabinet picks are coming forward, it leaves the question, well, how much power do these people really have? We know Health and Human Services has a wide scope, but this is not sort of unilateral power, right? What could RF Kennedy Jr. practically do and not do? Right, and he hasn't been confirmed yet, so we obviously need the Senate sign off for him to be able to do anything, but let's assume he's confirmed. As HHS secretary, he would have oversight over 13 different federal agencies. That's the CDC, the FDA, the NIH, and SAMHSA, which oversees uh, addiction and mental health. So pretty sweeping over that could affect the health of everyone in this country, essentially. Obviously, the thing that people are most concerned about probably is what can he do with vaccines. Uh, we don't really think he'll have a ton of authority to pull vaccines from the market completely. He has told NBC News he doesn't want to do that to be seen. Um, but we do know that there are some stepwise measures he could take. He could appoint anti-vaxxers to the FDA, cut funding, dissolve departments. All of that could really uh, change our guidelines and mandates that help us maintain our vaccination levels. So really the wild west ahead of us, unfortunately. And all of that, of course, as you said, conditional on those confirmations. Aria Bendix, thanks so much. In Missouri, two former police officers are facing federal charges. Both are accused of stealing nude or intimate photos and videos off women's cell phones during traffic stops. The two cases are separate and prosecutors say unconnected. So let's dig in with NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster Shack. First, I want to ask you about that case against a former fluorescent police officer. What is he accused of doing? Well, Zane Clay, prosecutors are saying that during traffic stops and under the guise of confirming vehicle of registration and car insurance, this officer, now former officer, would take the phones and did take the phones of more than 20 women and instead search those phones for explicit images. And when he found them, he would use his personal phone to take a picture of them before returning it. In one instance, prosecutors say he found an explicit video and texted himself from from the woman's phone and then deleted evidence of that text. Now, the Florissant uh, Police Department is saying they were completely unaware of these allegations before they were brought to them and released this statement saying that they are essentially disgusted at this behavior, which is a complete betrayal of the values hold and in no way reflects the professionalism and integrity of our dedicated officers. They talk about it being a breach of trust, which is a similar tone you heard from one of the women in this case who said she was humiliated and now has to be treated for the trauma she's experiencing. And Shaq, a former Missouri State Highway Patrol trooper, is, as we mentioned, facing similar charges in the same federal court. So what's the story behind that case and what are we hearing from both men? Yes, both of them are pleading not guilty in federal court. In this instance, with the Missouri uh, State Trooper, you see him on screen there, David McKnight, 39-year-old. Uh, it's involving nine women with a pretty similar fact pattern. Now, both of them are charged with deprivation of rights under the color of law and destroying records, or uh, one of them is charged with destroying records involved in a federal investigation. We've reached out to attorneys for both. We have not heard back. All right, Shaq Brewster with the latest for us. Thanks so much. Hi, now for the CNBC Money Minute. A car repair chain is closing hundreds of stores, and Kraft Mac and Cheese is the subject of a class action lawsuit. CNBC's Kate Rooney joints us now. Hi, Kate. Hi, Zinclay. So we'll start with Advanced Auto Parts closing more than 500 stores and 200 of its independent locations by mid-2025. That comes as it tries to turn around its struggling business. Advanced Auto did not share which locations will how many employees will be impacted. Meanwhile, a federal judge ruled Wednesday that Kraft Heinz must face a nationwide class action lawsuit. That lawsuit alleges the company defrauded customers by claiming its macaroni and cheese contained no artificial preservatives, while an ingredient Kraft Heinz used was a synthetic version, making that claim false. Kraft Heinz said its iconic mac and cheese had no official, artificial rather, additives that it's going to look forward to defending itself at trial. And if you thought returning items was burdensome, retailers actually feel the same. 59% of retailers said in a survey from returns management company ReturnPro, they had policies for refunds 
uh, for customers for items that don't make sense financially to ship those back. The National Retail Federation estimates for every $1 billion in sales a retailer makes, it goes through $145 million in return. Sinclair, back to you. Wow, a lot of money. Kate Rooney, thanks so much. And later this hour, it could be the most watched fight of all time, how the match